voices are not being transmitted over yet, are they? Okay, we got music.
Welcome to Lecture Night at the David Dunlap Observatory online with the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Toronto Centre. My name is Denise Chilton and I am the RASC Toronto Centre DDO Committee Chair and an operator of the 74-inch telescope at the David Dunlap Observatory. Together with Shaheen Dashkian, our Outreach Coordinator, I am delighted to be your host for tonight's lecture. I'm also very excited to welcome you, our viewers, to tonight's lecture. Please take a moment to say hi in the YouTube chat and tell us where you are joining us from. This helps us make sure that our technology is working properly. The Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's mission is to enhance understanding of and inspire curiosity about the universe through public outreach, education, and support for astronomical research. In partnership with the City of Richmond Hill, RASC hosts outreach activities at the David Dunlap Observatory, or DDO. The observatory is home to Canada's largest optical telescope. While we miss working from the DDO facility, we are happy to bring you these lecture nights in our season through this webcast instead. We would like to start by acknowledging that the David Dunlap Observatory in Richmond Hill stands on the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe peoples, whose presence here continues to this day. We would also like to acknowledge this land is at the meeting place of two treaties, the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and those of the First Nations of the Williams Treaty. We thank them and other Indigenous peoples for sharing this land with us. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight's lecture, Paul Delaney. Professor Delaney was born in South Australia and received his Bachelor of Science degree from the Australian National University in 1978 and his Master of Science from the University of Victoria, British Columbia in 1981. Since that time, he has worked as a nuclear physicist for Atomic Energy of Canada and a support astronomer at McGraw Hill Observatory near Tucson, Arizona. He has been a member of the Department of Physics and Astronomy at York University since 1986 where he teaches physics and astronomy courses for science and non-science students. He is also the director of the campus Allen I. Carswell Astronomical Observatory, which offers a teaching laboratory environment, research opportunities for science students studying astronomy, and extensive public outreach programs to the community. He's the inaugural Allen I. Carswell Chair for the Public Understanding of Astronomy. Between 2002 and 2016, he was the director of the Division of Natural Science, an academic unit that exposes nearly 12,000 undergraduate students annually to the world of science. Paul Delaney is perhaps best known in the amateur and professional astronomy communities as a passionate educator committed to public outreach. He has won numerous teaching and lecturing awards and truly delights in discussing the wonders of the universe with people of all ages. Tonight, Paul's lecture is titled Mars, the next chapter, and examines the latest explorations of the red planet. If you, our viewers, have questions for Paul, please ask them in the YouTube chat. He will have some time to, take, to answer questions at the end of his talk. So please join me in welcoming RASC member and Professor of Physics and Astronomy, Paul Delaney. Thank you very much, Denise, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And to everybody who has tuned in tonight uh, for this presentation for the David Dunlop Observatory, uh, courtesy of the RESC Toronto Centre. My pleasure to be here, and what a wonderful topic. I mean, Mars has been on everybody's lips for the last three months uh, since the arrival of three new spacecraft in February of this year, and this last couple of weeks with the flight of the Ingenuity helicopter. It's a wonderful time to be talking about Mars. But uh, you know, I will be talking not just about what we're doing at the moment on the surface of Mars, but what we have done, how we've gotten to this point. Because of course, you know, what we're doing today has been built by the past explorations and the explorations over the last 40 years have been terrific. So more about that in just a moment. 
I've, of course, got to give a quick ad. Uh, while the 1.8 meter telescope at the David Dunlop Observatory is a fabulous instrument, uh, we've got a nice little one over at the university as well. Uh, it's a nice one meter telescope. You have an opportunity to look through it virtually at this point in time, of course, as well as connect with the students of the Alan I. Carswell Observatory on Monday and Wednesday nights. There's no shortage of ways for you to engage astronomy, be it with the RESC, be it with York University, the town of Richmond Hill, a couple more opportunities for you here being shown on the screen Monday and Wednesday evenings via York University. As I said, we've got a wonderful 21st century one meter class telescope. You see it there in the top left hand corner. On Wednesday nights, weather permitting, we try to get you to see objects that are visible to that telescope. And if it's cloudy, that's a problem here, of course, in Toronto, uh, you see archival images and you get to ask students all sorts of questions. Getting students out of our dome is now the big problem, not getting them into the dome. They just love playing with our one meter telescope. Okay, on with the show here. Of course, one of the fundamental questions that we always have to answer, many people always ask it, why are we exploring the planets? Well, of course, I'm going to confine my commentary to planets in our solar system, but as many of you are probably aware, there are 7,000 and counting exoplanets that we are monitoring now. And based upon the statistics of those 7,000 exoplanets, where we've found them, how we've found them, and so on, it is really, really likely, highly probable, that every single star in the Milky Way galaxy, and there's about 200 billion of them, have a planetary system. So understanding the planets of our own solar system, in our own backyard, if you will, gives us terrific insight into those exoplanets of which there are literally billions and billions and probably billions of Earth-like planets. So understanding Venus, Mars, Jupiter, the other planets in our solar system is really very fundamental to us understanding planets in general. And of course, as we search the planets locally, as well as the planets further out, we are really trying to answer this question. Are we alone? The search for life is something that we have been captivated by as, as a species, as humans, for probably as long as humans have been <laughs> alive on this planet. But in particular, over the last 60 or so years, since the dawn of the space age back in 1957, we have had tools available to us to be able to search in unprecedented ways, being able to go to the moon physically, now being able to explore the planets at the moment robotically, to be able to explore the universe above the Earth's atmosphere with instrumentation has given us new insights into the whole question of, are we alone? At this moment in time, as you and I are chatting tonight, the only place that we know of that has life is here on Earth. But the next probably most likely location in our solar system, if life can exist outside of the Earth, is Mars. And so the last 40 or more years, we have spent a lot of time, effort and energy exploring the planet Mars, the fourth planet from the sun. Okay, so just a couple of quickie facts about Mars, physically speaking. It's a planet that's all oh, about half the size of the Earth, a little over half of our diameter. But there, uh, you know, the similarities do tend to stop. Speaking about the planet as a whole, you know, it's it's got rocks that are very similar to our own. We have a few volcanoes on Mars. They are extinct at this point in time, or at least dormant. But the characteristics of Mars really are very different to Earth. So for example, when you think about the atmosphere of Earth, great planet to live on in terms of deep breath, oxygen, nitrogen, all the life that's around us. When we look over at Mars, the atmosphere, very, very thin, only about 1% as thick as Earth's. When we look to the composition of that atmosphere, carbon dioxide. So you and I will never be able to stand on the plains of Mars and breathe deeply, not unless we go and terraform it. And that's not likely to happen anytime soon, if ever. Uh, there is no water on the surface of Mars. It's too cold. The atmospheric pressure is too low. So unlike Earth, where we've got this beautiful blue marble, Mars is this sort of rusty colored dust bowl. So big, big differences between these planets. And of course, your first reaction might be, well, it's a very inhospitable environment. How could life possibly exist there? Well, I will say to you that life is very tenacious. On this planet, Earth, we have 
life forms, extremophiles, that are able to survive in the most unlikely of environmental conditions. Life has tenacity, and maybe that tenacity has carried it forward in time from when Mars was reasonably hospitable to today's environment. Again, more about that very shortly. Another interesting feature on Mars is this huge rift valley that cuts across the equatorial plain of Mars, Valles Marineris. It's huge, nearly 5,000 kilometers in length. So Mars has some geologic features that are somewhat reminiscent to features we find here on Earth. But overall, the, the planetary surface is really quite different and very, very harsh today. The atmosphere, though, does support clouds. It doesn't rain on Mars. As I said, it's a little too cold for that. The atmospheric pressure is too low. But there is water vapor in the atmosphere. And it does condense and it does form clouds, especially at higher elevations. You can see here clouds above the uh, volcanic chain uh, in the Tharsis region of Mars. But clouds form on Mars every single day. And watching the cloud patterns change gives us great insight into the weather, the wind patterns on Mars. It's actually a very active area of study to look at the clouds on Mars. If you are standing on the surface, you may have difficulty seeing those clouds. In other words, we have to enhance the imagery that we are getting back from the surface to be able to follow the features of the clouds on Mars. But rest assured, the Martian atmosphere is a very active place despite the relatively cold temperatures and the very low pressures there. I did say that we've got volcanoes on Mars. This is, in fact, the largest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons. It stands, as you can see from the scale there, some 500 kilometers across at its base. And the caldera towers nearly 20, 25 kilometers above the mean datum point on Mars. Saying sea level doesn't really make much sense on Mars because there's no sea. But there is a mean elevation. And Olympus Mons stands about 25 kilometers above that elevation. So it's a huge, monstrous volcano. But I do draw your attention to the fact that the sides, the flanks, the slopes, are not filled with craters. Now, there are some there, but they're not filled with craters. And what that tells you is that the environment on the slopes of uh, Olympus Mons have not been subjected to lava flows in uh, you know, the, 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 the recent geologic past, but they have had flows of lava. Because if this volcano had been dormant for 3 billion years, there would be numerous craters across the sides of Olympus Mons. We see a few. So obviously, this was an active volcano in the past, but geologically speaking, perhaps over the last few million years, uh, you know, a little bit quieter. So one of those enigmas on Mars that we need to better understand, what is the current level of geologic activity beneath the surface of Mars? Well, to be able to fully understand the Martian environment requires more than just telescopes from Earth. We've been looking at Mars since you know, 1609, the invention of the telescope, when Galileo turned it towards the uh, night sky and began to examine carefully objects in the night sky. But you can only learn so much from sort of 50 million, 150 million kilometers away. Earth, Mars distance varies considerably, but at best, we don't get closer than about 55 million kilometers. Even the best telescopes on our planet or in orbit, the Hubble Space Telescope, you can only see so much detail. To be able to truly understand the surface environment, the atmospheric circulation, the weather, how all of that has changed over the last three to four billion years, You've got to be there. You've got to be on the ground. You've got to be in orbit. You've got to be able to you know, monitor the changing environment of Mars through its entire you know, yearly cycle and examine, of course, the composition of the surface to gain insight into how Mars has changed over the lifetime of the solar system. But getting spacecraft to Mars is not easy. Tongue in cheek, uh, sports analogy, it's half time. You know, at this point in time, of the 39 spacecraft that were sent to Mars at the time that this diagram was made, Mars had literally destroyed 24 of them, or we had put them into the uh, Pacific Ocean. In other words, 24 of the 39 missions had failed, and only 15 had successfully gotten there. Mars is hard to get to. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of stories, the Mars jinx and so on and so forth, but the bottom line to it is space travel is difficult. 
And in the first sort of 40 or 50 years of our exploration of space, we were still learning how to do it. And there were a lot of failures uh, up until around about the year 2000. I'm pleased to report that Earth has staged the comeback. And now as of 2021, the sort of you know, I can't say half time show anymore, but I mean, you know, the score is now 32 to 26. We've been far more successful since 2000 in successfully going into orbit around Mars or down to the surface of Mars. Uh, and we've gained terrific insight into the planetary environment, particularly over the last 20 years. But we've only been successful in the last 20 years because the previous 40 years we had tried so very, very hard. So, you know, you've got to look at this as a 60 year history of Mars exploration. These spacecraft, of course, can do a number of uh, activities. They can fly by the planet, and that was the easy thing that we used to do back in the 60s. Uh, then, of course, we figured out how we could get into orbit around those planets. And more recently, over the last 20 years, roughly speaking, uh, we have been able to land on the surface, and now we rove the surface, or roam <laughs> the surface. Uh, so there are a number of differing ways we can explore the planet. Uh, just to remind you that uh, you know, even though you know, we're in front now, 32 to 26, uh, back in 2016, there was an experimental lander by the name of Schiaparelli. It was a joint ESA-Russia mission to Mars. Uh, they put a satellite into, uh, into uh, Mars orbit, the uh, Trace Gas Orbiter, that's still operating today, but they sent a spacecraft by the name of Schiaparelli towards the surface. Unfortunately, at an altitude of about three to four kilometers, the onboard radar system and the computer systems more or less concluded that the spacecraft was approaching the ground and turned off the engine, the descent motor that was slowing the vehicle down. And of course, at a height of three kilometers, when you turn off the engine, you can imagine what happened. That crater that you see in the middle of the image on the right there is one of the most recent craters on Mars, but this one was human made. So even today, five years ago, it was really, really hard to get to the surface of Mars. Since then, we've been quite successful, the InSight mission in 2018 from NASA, but the real excitement was this year, 2021 in February, when the United Arab Emirates and their HOPE mission went into orbit. The Chinese orbiter, Tianwen, went into orbit, and they're going to be deploying a rover this month, uh, next month, the month of May, and of course, the Perseverance rover from NASA. So really, really exciting stuff at this moment in time. But let me just sort of, you know, put the, the, the whole Mars exploration in a little more perspective. If you go back to 1976, that's when the Viking mission went to Mars. And this was the first truly successful mission that put vehicles on the surface of Mars and returned science data and it, it returned data in, in just volumes. For nearly five years, the lander, was able to transmit data about its immediate environment, both atmospheric information, as well as surface analysis, including our first attempts at looking for signs of life on the Martian surface. The first images, complete images from the surface of Mars, you can see here, the lower right-hand corner was the first black and white image. You can see the foot on the ground there, and then the first color image from the surface. And that's yeah, you know, pretty well what Mars looks like today. Every single mission that we have sent to Mars gives us the same sort of rocky, sandy, rusty colored appearance. And I do use the word rust very uh, uh, appropriately because the surface is rich in iron oxides. That's what gives it its distinctive sort of clay, rusty appearance. And the sky, no blue rally scattering like we have here on Earth, but rather this sort of uh, I don't know, crimson colored sky. Uh, it, it changes depending on where the sun is. But that top left hand image, that's what Mars really does look like. So we've been on the surface of Mars for basically 45 years, 1976 through to 2021. This was our first taste of the Martian environment. And while the life science experiments were basically inconclusive, most scientists would say indicated that there was no signs of life on the surface. Uh, they are still debated hotly in some circles today, but we found no definitive evidence. Of course, we found that the surface mineralogy, the geology was actually quite reminiscent of Earth. And as night became day, we saw frost being deposited onto the various surfaces of our landing spacecraft. So we knew that there was an active cycle 
associated with water vapor and ice. It can't be in liquid, as I said, so it's, you know, the atmospheric pressure won't allow that. But 1976 was when we really began to understand the Martian environment. The case for water was being built from those early days, from the Mariner images that were orbiting the planet, from the Viking images that were orbiting the planet. You can see images on the left here, which are very, very suggestive of past water flow on the surface of Mars. Now, we can't have liquid water on the surface today, and by all accounts, we haven't had water on the surface of Mars for over 3 billion years. But for the half a billion to billion years that we believe water did exist, it eroded away, it scarred the surface, and those surface indications are with us today. Even images on the right-hand side, that's an animated GIF that you're looking at, taken by the Mars Reconnaissance Observer, it's one place on the surface, several images taken throughout the course of the day. And you can see that there is a distinct change in the hue, in the color of that area. It is being interpreted, and it's being debated as well, but it's being interpreted that the color changes are a result of some of the ice, which is just beneath the surface, mixing with the salts, which are deposited on the surface, and there are significant amounts of salt deposits on Mars. And as Canadians, we know what happens when you mix ice and salt, you end up with sort of you know, really cold water. You know, we put salt over our roads to lower the freezing point and keep ice in a liquid form in our winters. What we think is happening here on the right is that the ice is, when the day gets warm enough, so basically noon, it's able to create a bit of a salty brine, a very, very salt-enriched water slurry that wets, dampens the surface and turns it a little darker. And then as the day cools down, that water returns to its icy environment and the cycle begins again. Whether or not that is really what is happening, there is good indication that it is, but we're not certain of it. There is no doubt from the erosion that we see across the surface that water did once flow very freely on the surface of Mars. We were back on the surface of Mars in 1997 with the Pathfinder Sojourner mission. And this was our first deployment of a rover. It's about the size of a microwave oven, a microwave oven on wheels, but it was able to traverse several hundred meters, well, actually about a hundred meters away from the landing spacecraft. This has huge implications for Mars exploration. Up until this point in time, the landers could only examine what was within reach of a robotic arm, a couple of meters, or what their cameras could image, you know, perhaps, you know, a few hundred meters away, but you could not get up close and personal with your instrumentation. You couldn't take spectra. You couldn't dig into the sample and look at the composition and so on. Now, with the Pathfinder Sojourner mission, the rover was able to go around and look at targets of interest. And now we were beginning to get a much more complete perception of what the rocks on the surface of Mars were all about. They're basically basalts. Uh, and the sand dunes, again, we could get up close and examine them. Uh, erosion from those same rocks rich in iron oxides. So 1997 Pathfinder Sojourner, the next stage of evolution of our exploration of the Martian surface. That paved the way for the 2003-04 mission uh, where Spirit and Opportunity, rovers that were about the size of a golf cart now, were able to not only land successfully on the surface of Mars, but were able to scout kilometers in fact, the Opportunity mission ran for nearly 14 years and drove in excess of 46 kilometers across the surface of Mars. And you can imagine the types of surface features into and out of craters, up to and around boulders, looking at uh, differing sand dunes. Now, literally, the entire surface is available to us for exploration. Spirit and Opportunity were phenomenally successful missions. Spirit only lasted for about seven years, but given the fact that both of these uh, rovers were destined to only operate for three months or thereabouts, the fact that they operated for up to 14 years, huge triumph of engineering and technology. They took a number of differing images, but I draw your attention in particular to the bottom image here. 
opportunity literally landed and rolled by airbag deployment. It landed and rolled into a very shallow crater by the name of Eagle One. And when its cameras were deployed, literally when it opened its eyes for the first time, it looked straight into a sedimentary rock layer. Sedimentary rocks, of course, are laid down on Earth courtesy of the action of erosion of water or by water. Opportunity literally landed in basically a, a form of puddle <laughs> on Mars. And the very first thing it did is it drove over to the sedimentary rock layer and, and analyzed it, found uh, various minerals in there called blueberries that could only have formed in the presence of water. So literally within a week of opportunity landing, one of the primary goals of the mission to establish the fact that there was geological evidence support for flowing water on the surface of Mars had been met. And Spirit and Opportunity went on to find countless other examples of both standing and flowing water on the surface of Mars. You can also see some action in the atmosphere there. That's a dust devil. There are literally hundreds of dust devils that cross the planetary surface on a daily basis. So Mars is an active, vibrant environment. And now we know without a shadow of a doubt that some three to four billion years ago, there was water in significant copious amounts on the surface of Mars. Just to give you a bit of a feel for where uh, Opportunity went, you can see this odyssey of 45 kilometers and change from its original landing site. It went around smaller craters and when it finally met its demise during a uh, sandstorm, a dust storm two years ago, it was exploring Endeavour Crater, a 22 kilometer diameter crater on the surface of Mars. It was a fabulous robotic geologist that really gave us unprecedented insights into the Martian environment, past and present. Okay, so the Martian environment has obviously changed. Why? Well, we believe that Mars, like Earth, like the other terrestrial planets, Mars, Mercury, Venus, Earth, formed four and a half billion years ago, and after being in a molten state, began to cool. So as the sun fired up its nuclear furnace and began to sweep clear the leftover dust and debris of our solar system, the planets, particularly the terrestrial planets, began to cool. Now, Earth is about 12 and a half thousand kilometers in diameter. You cool from the outside in. So the crust begins to form as it cools because, of course, it is exposed to the relative cold of space. Mars does the same thing. However, Earth is a much larger volume. So therefore, the molten material inside is a significantly larger amount of it, and therefore there's a much larger heat reservoir. Earth cooled more slowly than Mars. Mars being smaller, it began to cool relatively quickly, and so the crust formed and then the mantle formed. The interior, the core, probably remained liquid for 500, maybe 1 billion years, 500 million to 1 billion years. But by the time 500 million years had elapsed, our models suggest that the Mars surface environment was probably decidedly hospitable based upon the rate of cooling of the planet. As a planet cools, it outgasses the trapped volatile materials like carbon dioxide, oxygen, nitrogen, water vapor that is trapped in the rocks. As the planet cools, those uh, gaseous volatile components get expelled out onto the surface of Mars. And so Mars probably built up an atmosphere, we estimate, two thirds as thick as Earth is today. And it had that relatively mild, relatively mild environment, relatively thick atmosphere by about 4 billion years ago. Mm -hmm. Comparable time on Earth, we were still quite warm on the surface. Liquid water had not yet formed. Yes, we were forming an atmosphere, but it was still really hot on the surface, too hot for water. So Mars was actually a more hospitable environment at that moment in time than was Earth. Hence why we suspect, hope, that if life was able to gain a foothold on Mars, it would have done it earlier than Earth's foothold. Earth, signs of life on Earth, formed around about 3.8 billion years ago. There's a bit of debate. Is it 3.6? Is it 3.9? Most scientists come down in and around 3.8 billion years ago. As I said, by 4 billion years ago, though, Mars was probably quite hospitable. 
So that means that there was water on the surface, there was a thick atmosphere, there was a magnetic field. As Mars is cooling, it is also going through a process called differentiation. And that basically means that the denser materials, things like metals, sink to the planetary core. Circulating electric currents in that metallic core give rise to a magnetic field. And the magnetic field protects the planetary environment from the charged particles streaming off of the sun. So literally, Mars was hospitable. It was habitable back 4 billion years ago. Whether life was able to gain a foothold at that point in time, we simply do not know. But Mars being relatively small means that the gravitational field is modest. It's only about a third the gravitational field strength at its surface than it is on Earth. And as Mars continued to cool, that core went from being a liquid metallic core to a solid core. Models suggest that this all transpired in and around 3.5 billion years ago. Not overnight, it was gradually moving to that point. Without the magnetic field to protect the planetary atmosphere, the solar wind, this sort of stream of charged particles from the sun, acts very much like sandpaper on the atmosphere. And it literally erodes away the atmosphere. And because Mars's gravitational field is unable to hold that atmosphere, then literally the atmosphere leaked away. By 3 billion years ago, the atmospheric pressure on Mars is what we see it today, about 1%. That meant that the liquid water that was on the surface from 4 billion to 3.5 billion years ago, roughly speaking, either had to evaporate into the atmosphere or freeze into the soil. There's certainly no shortage of ice beneath the surface of Mars, but unfortunately any water vapor that goes into the atmosphere without the presence of a magnetic field is going to experience both the sandblasting effect of the solar wind collisions, and of course, without the atmosphere, the ultraviolet radiation from the sun is going to what we call photo disintegrate the water molecule, creating oxygen and hydrogen, which both again can escape into space. Bottom line to it is what was once a reasonably habitable environment 4 billion years ago by 3 billion years ago was the type of desert environment that we see today. We're very confident of that sequence that I have just given you because we have a spacecraft in orbit by the name of MAVEN. It's basically an atmospheric, a volatile atmospheric uh, monitor, and it is actually able to see the way the Martian atmosphere is still leaking away into space. It's in some measure of equilibrium now, but the mechanism that has been happening for the last three billion years, we can still see happening today. And MAVEN is able to actually measure that and quantify it. We are very, very confident of our understanding of the evolution of the Martian atmosphere and what happened to the surface, and hence why it is such an inhospitable environment today. I've said to you that there's lots of ice beneath the surface. This is basically ground penetrating radar at the North Pole of Mars. And you can see huge sheets of subsurface ocean. Now, this is really not ocean, excuse me, ice. <laughs> there might be some water as in liquid water beneath that. But what we're seeing here with the ground penetrating radar is ice, a huge amount of it. And it extends down to uh, you know fairly low latitudes. Most of it is around the poles, North and South Pole, but there is still ice at, you know, literally, you know, 70, 60 degrees latitude. And, uh, you know, we wanted to be able to be sure that this really was ice. And so we sent a spacecraft there in 2008, its name was Phoenix. We sent it to the North Polar region, about 70 degrees North latitude. And its primary mission was to literally dig into the ground and not only characterize the surface conditions, but look for the signs of ice. It also had a, a LIDAR, which is basically a, a laser radar, that was being used to characterize the atmosphere. Phoenix was, again, a little bit like Opportunity. One of the first images, once the vehicle went to the ground, this is not a rover, this is a stationary lander. Once it got to the ground, it literally looked at the surface beneath the lander itself, and the retro thrusters that had helped the lander arrive safely had blown the surface regolith, the surface soil, away and exposed sheets of ice. So exactly what we were expecting to find subsurface, we saw with one of our very first images 
from Phoenix. We dug into that ice. If you melt that ice, you and I could drink it. It is very good water, which is terrific news as far as human settlements are concerned. I mean, if we don't have to take all of the water to Mars, if we just dig up the ice, melt it, then you and I have potable, drinkable water. And we, of course, have got water to grow crops. You'll have to do it inside pressure uh, vessels, uh, inside you know, bubbles, so as to speak, because you can't grow uh, plants in the open on Mars. Again, the atmosphere is just not going to allow it. But we have got water on the surface to irrigate. And of course, you know, you break water molecules apart, hydrogen and oxygen, you've got oxygen to, to breathe, and you've got hydrogen fuel uh, for various purposes. So being certain about the ice that is on Mars, very, very important. I also indicated we had this LIDAR instrument, laser radar, and it was able to profile vertically the atmosphere. Well, one of the things that it was able to do, of course, was monitor the clouds. Here you can see a cloud deck uh, in and around the three and a half, four kilometer uh, region. And you can see on the, uh, the horizontal axis, the X axis there, time during the day. As the day progressed, the cloud began to dissipate by literally raining its water towards the ground. We're, of course, not talking about liquid water, we're talking about solid water. It was basically snowing on Mars on this particular day that Phoenix was observing the atmosphere. That snow doesn't reach the ground in any significant way, so we're not talking about ski hills, but we're talking about an atmosphere that is very, very reminiscent in its activity to what we see here on Earth. And so this LIDAR instrument, the atmospheric monitoring, all of that was Canadian technology. It was actually built here in Toronto. So how fitting is it that you know, a Canadian instrument, a weather station on Mars, was able to detect the first signs of snowfall? Okay, well, that is the, the run-up to today. We've had three generations of rovers now. We've seen uh, the Pathfinder Sojourner there in the lower left. You've seen Spirit and Opportunity in the upper left. Now let's talk about curiosity and perseverance. Perseverance and curiosity, they're about the size of small SUVs. They weigh about one ton. And unlike Pathfinder Sojourner, Spirit and Opportunity, curiosity and perseverance run with what we call radioisotope thermoelectric generators. They don't rely on solar panels. And that gives them far more resilience. These two rovers, Curiosity and Perseverance, Curiosity arrived in 2012, Perseverance arrived this year, are loaded with terrific instrumentation to examine the surface of Mars, to examine the atmosphere of Mars in absolutely unprecedented detail. Curiosity has obviously been running for over eight years. It'll be nine years in August. Perseverance, we're hoping, will have a similar lifetime. Getting to the surface of Mars, by the way, uh, is not easy. Just in case you were thinking that it was uh, you know, easy, it's not. Uh, these vehicles are arriving at Mars, coming from Earth, traveling at about 20,000 kilometers an hour. Because Mars and Earth are so far apart, the light travel time for radio signals to get from Earth to Mars is at best three or four minutes, and at worst, up to 20 minutes. It means that when the vehicle arrives at Mars, at the upper atmosphere of Mars, traveling at 20,000 kilometers an hour, it has approximately seven minutes to descend to the surface of Mars safely, and it's got to do it all on autopilot. There is no opportunity for that vehicle to talk to mission control back here on Earth. It's got to do it all by itself. So it hits the atmosphere at 20,000 kilometers an hour. It uses the heat shield to bleed off a lot of that speed, a lot of that energy. That's why the heat shield glows very hot. They deploy the heat shield uh, a couple of minutes into flight, or about three minutes into flight. Then they deploy a parachute, which is not easy to do at 1,000 kilometers an hour, even in a very thin atmosphere. And then after the parachute brings the vehicle down to a modest you know, couple of hundred kilometers an hour, then they jettison the, uh, the parachute. They fire up the propulsion system, retro thrusters, if you will, and they bring the vehicle close to the ground, but then it holds in station keeping mode for a minute or so while a sky crane literally lowers the vehicle, the rover, to the surface of Mars. And then once the rover is on the ground, the propulsion system then flies away anywhere but here, leaving the rover successfully on the ground. All of that happens in seven minutes on autopilot. 
and why we call it the seven minutes of terror. <laughs> uh, this is a couple of images from the Perseverance descent. You see the sky crane there in the top left. So you can see the cables from the propulsion system down to the rover. You can see the, uh, the parachute being deployed uh, in the lower left hand corner. And then the first image from Perseverance was taken by one of its hazard avoidance cameras there. This is on the plain of Yezero Crater. Yezero Crater is a place which we believe was an ancient lake bed. So three and a half billion years ago, this was filled to the brim with water. It was also the end point for a river that deposited water into Yezero Crater before all of that changed to place, the climate change, which eventually evaporated everything. If you're going to go look for signs of life, if you're going to see the signs of a really moist Mars environment, then you want to look at the geology of an ancient lake bed. And that's why Perseverance is in Yezero Crater. And here you can see the plains of Yezero from Perseverance's perspective. This vehicle has got spectrographs on board. It's got terrific high resolution cameras. It's got an onboard laser, which can actually sort of turn rocks into plasma from a distance. Again, giving us insights into the composition. They've got drills on board so that you can actually extract material from within a rock, not just the surface of the rock, the surface erodes, of course. So you want to be able to look at the more pristine material within the rock. And there's onboard sample analysis. So we can actually take samples from the surface and pass it through the instrumentation on board to better characterize the identity of everything that is on the soil. If there are organic molecules, Perseverance will be able to find them. One of the engineering test missions that went with the Perseverance rover was a little Mars helicopter by the name of Ingenuity. This is about 1.8 kilograms of material. It stands only about 50 centimeters tall. So it's really, really tiny. Uh, and it is able to achieve powered flight. We can say that now because, as you can see, on April 19th, it took to the skies of Mars. It's flown four times now uh, for up to two minutes at a time, flying up to 100 meters away from its current landing site. They have nicknamed it Wright Brothers Field, uh, Airfield. But Ingenuity has proven, despite the really, really low uh, atmospheric pressure, that you can generate lift of this vehicle. And it's been flying at altitudes of only about five meters, but it has a bird's eye perspective of the environment around it. But, uh, Ingenuity doesn't have any science instrumentation on board. It's really just an engineering test module, but it's transitioning now. So successful has it been. It's transitioning into a scout. It's actually going to scout ahead of Perseverance as Perseverance moves across the plains of Yezero. Ingenuity will help look for the best science targets of opportunity and also to find the best pathways away from sand dunes and big rocks and cracks in the ground and so on, so that Perseverance will have the most efficient route to its next science target. I really do encourage you to pop onto the uh, NASA website and have a look at some of the stunning imagery that the uh, helicopter Ingenuity has been able to achieve, even taking a quickie photograph here of the Perseverance rover. So this Ingenuity helicopter is signs of things to come as far as uh, you know, the future exploration on the surface of Mars is concerned. And here is just another photograph of uh, Ingenuity in flight as it moves out of camera uh, downwind 100 meters or so. A fabulous engineering demonstration from the Ingenuity. And you can see the background, the various uh, crater rim, uh, the sculpting of the crater rim around the Yezero crater. What's next for the surface of Mars? Well, we can always hope that there will be humans on the surface of Mars. Maybe within the next 10 years, certainly not before 2030, I don't believe, but NASA's return to the moon is certainly signaling renewed interest in human exploration in space. The hardware that we need to go to the moon is being redeveloped. And if successful, that same hardware can be scaled up to go to Mars. One big difference between now and the previous sort of 40 or 50 years is that NASA is no longer alone as far as developing space hardware is concerned. 
The International Space Station is an excellent example of showing you what can happen when cooperation between various nations is brought to bear. And of course, there are the commercial space interests, SpaceX, Blue Origin, that are developing really good space technology, hardware that when blended with the expertise of the other spacefaring nations on this planet could literally take us to Mars by 2030 if we so chose. The European Space Agency and NASA want to bring back rocks that Perseverance is collecting in a sample return mission by 2030. So the technology required to get us from here to Mars and back is well in hand. We haven't solved all the problems. There's issues associated with radiation in space, radiation on the surface of Mars. You've probably heard about living in lava tubes and so on. It's not easy to go to Mars. It's not easy to live on the surface of Mars. But unlike almost any other era that I can think of, there is a real sense that the, the hardware is coming of age. It's maturing to the point where humans could be on the surface of Mars in the early 2030s. So that's something to look forward to. But in the meantime, stay tuned for curiosity, perseverance, ingenuity, and the sample return mission. It's a wonderful time to be following Mars. And on that note, I will stop and hand it back to Denise and Shaheen for questions. Thank you so much, Professor Delaney, for this fantastic glimpse of Mars and the history of Mars exploration and discoveries. We're going to check in now with our outreach coordinator, Shaheen Dashkian, for any questions from our YouTube audience. Shaheen? Thank you, Denise. Um, Paul, I hope you don't have any plans for this evening because we have a lot of amazing <laughs> questions uh, for you in our YouTube chat. So I'm just going to fire them off at you one at a time and you can Go ahead and answer them. So uh, the first one we have is from Lewis Rifkin. Um, and he's asking, is it really practical to terraform Mars? If so, how long would it likely take? It's probably not practical to terraform Mars. And that's putting aside the question of whether or not ethically we should terraform Mars. But I'll just answer from the science perspective. Uh, there have been lots of studies done about how you would terraform Mars. And the common denominator is it is just not easy. And it is certainly not quick and whether or not it actually can be done is still a topic of debate but if you can increase the atmospheric pressure then you can now develop uh, the opportunity for water to exist on the surface of mars and that of course would promote more uh, forms of life uh, plant life to uh, exist on the surface of mars and if you can do that they can suck in the carbon dioxide and expel oxygen now there are certainly no shortage of, op, um, of theories about the way that could happen, but most of them are talking thousands to tens of thousands of years for it to be achieved. Uh, so it's not easy, it's not quick, and it's not cheap, uh, but whether or not we should be doing it, of course, is a completely different question. Thank you. Uh, so we have another one from Lewis. Um, he's asking, what about exploring Mars's moons? Ah, in fact, there are a couple of missions that are going to fly, if all goes well, in the mid-2020s that will go to both Phobos and Deimos. Uh, both the Russian Space Federation and the European Space Agency are both very interested in going to those satellites. Uh, whether or not those satellites actually formed with Mars or were captured asteroids, that's one of the really big questions. Phobos is spiraling in towards Mars and uh, give or take a bit of a million years, will actually break up. Um, Deimos won't do that, it's spiraling outwards. So there are a lot of really interesting questions about Mars's history that the moon, Phobos and Deimos, can probably give us insight into. And that uh, insight has not been lost on various agencies. NASA is not planning, to the best of my knowledge, uh, a, a trip to either of those satellites, but Space travel is very international these days. Uh, the uh, European Space Agency mission will carry with it international instrumentation, which will probably include Canadian contributions because we're really interested in Mars too. Uh, so stay tuned. I would think that within about five years, we will have probes uh, looking at, if not on the surface of both Phobos and Deimos. Not people, these are robotic explorers. 
Great. Uh, so we have one from Bruce Kasugi. Um, they're asking if Mars were as large as the Earth, uh, would it have retained most of its atmosphere? Absolutely. Um, if uh, yeah, gravity is is one really important aspect of this question, uh, because if it was larger than it currently is, then it is highly likely that its uh, molten interior near its core would have stayed in that state just like we have here on Earth. We have a molten liquid outer core, and that's what gives rise to our magnetic field. If Mars was comparable in size to Earth, then it is highly likely that the same could be said of Mars. And if you have a magnetosphere that is protecting the planet, then the solar wind can't do the same sort of damage that it has done on Mars. So between an improved gravitational field to retain the atmosphere, uh, a likely magnetic field to surround the planet, therefore to protect the atmosphere, yes, Mars would be much more reminiscent of Earth. It would likely have liquid water on its surface, but of course it still would be cold. I mean, it is further from the sun than the Earth is. It's on the outer edge of the habitable zone. So what that means is that having liquid water on its surface is sort of an iffy situation, but at the height of summer, if you will, for one hemisphere or the other, the temperature does get above zero degrees Celsius. And if you had a decent enough atmosphere, it would retain that watery environment. So it wouldn't be Earth too, but it certainly would be more reminiscent of Earth than it is now. Great, thank you. Uh, we have our uh, friend Lewis back again with another great question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this one says, uh, now that we know that the water is common off of Earth, it is important to explore Enceladus for signs of life. How uh, will such a potential discovery affect humans living on Mars? Wow. Um, okay. So yeah, water is surprisingly common throughout the solar system. Uh, yeah, when I was going to grad school <clears throat> a few years ago, uh, yeah, water, liquid water in the solar system was thought to be really, really scarce, and that the only place you're going to find liquid water was on Earth. Well, we now know that is wrong. You know, subsurface ocean of Europa, the uh, subsurface ocean and Enceladus. We suspect quite strongly that there is subsurface water uh, on Mars or in Mars, if you will, and so on. So liquid water is actually fairly common throughout the solar system, surprisingly common. We shouldn't be so surprised because oxygen is actually the most common element after hydrogen and helium. And of course, hydrogen is very common. So getting hydrogen and oxygen together, uh, you know, it, it just had to happen everywhere in the universe. If we were able to find life, either in the oceans of Enceladus, the ocean of, of, of uh, Europa, maybe even the lakes of Titan. I mean, you know, we're thinking about water as the best solvent, but we've got lots of um, um, uh, methane on the surface of Titan. It's a lot colder and so on, but nonetheless, it acts in a similar solvent manner to Earth. Finding life anywhere else in our solar system, I think would be quite profound. And it would suggest, to me at least, that life was very common in our universe. If, if Earth remains the only place that we can find life as we search for biosignatures around exoplanets, as we search for the environments in our own solar system for signs of life, if Earth continues to come up to be the only place where life is existing, then mm, it's, it's, it's a lot harder to argue that life is common. But if we were able to find life elsewhere in our solar system, I think all bets are off. I think life is everywhere. Thank you for that. Uh, we have Brian um, asking, given its weak and variable magnetic field plus thin atmosphere, would humans on Mars for a year or longer need to find caves or go underground to minimize serious radiation exposure? In fact, Mars's uh, magnetic field is basically non-existent now. There is no global magnetic field. There are pockets of magnetism, but there is no global magnetic field on Mars. It has literally been frozen out because of the solidification of its core. Uh, as a consequence of that, yes, uh, you know, radiation exposure is one of the big challenges, one of the big problems for any human settlement on Mars. And that's why lava tubes, caves, and so on, uh, natural defenses, even you know, build a big bubble and just you know, bury it, if you will, with Martian soil, that would help a lot. Uh, so we do have to find a way to protect human life on the surface of Mars. And, and by the way, that goes for plants too. I mean, I, I said before, we've got water that we can use for irrigation. If you introduced 
uh, you know, uh, biological agents into the surface soil inside your, uh, you know, your insulated dome, then, you know, you can grow plants, you know, remember the Martian movie, that was really quite accurate, but there is still a lot of radiation that is coming down from the sun, which is not good for a lot of plants. So yes, it is a huge issue. It's one that we don't have a solution to. We can't carry with us enough shielding because that shielding is very massive. It's very heavy, uh, taking it to Mars. And so utilizing the natural defenses of the planet, caves, lava tubes, and so, or as I said, you know, just burying uh, your, your um, uh, habitats with soil, maybe that's the, the short-term solution to protecting human life on the surface of Mars from the radiation. All right, so this one is from uh, our good friend Blake. Uh, he says, Andy Weir wrote the novel The Martian uh, that later turned into a movie. Uh, the novel was regarded as highly factual and scientifically accurate, but can we actually grow potatoes in the soil? Yes, you can. Uh, the Martian soil is very reminiscent of Earth soil. So when you, you, know, you pick up some soil from your backyard, putting aside the microbial action, okay? The microbial action that is in all of our soil here on Earth is not present on Mars. Hence why in the movie, uh, he went to the lengths of basically taking <laughs> a human excrement and burying it into the soil to introduce biological factors. So there is that problem, there is that difference. The soil on Mars is biologically inert and therefore you can't grow plants. But if you can introduce biological agents, the soil, once moistened, will support plant growth. And there's all sorts of um, uh, investigations being done literally right now to figure out what are the best plants, uh, as in you know, food plants, to grow on the surface of Mars. Those that have the smallest gestation period from you know, planting to actually harvesting, uh, find out what those most nutritional short-term growth uh, timelines are so that our first settlements there can literally become farmers on day two after they've put up this their habitat on day one day two they become farmers and they are able to uh, at least gray, grow some measure of food to sustain them so the answer is yes but you do have to introduce biological contaminants microbes if you will and of course you do have to add water to it all right uh this one you may have touched on a little bit, but if you'd like to go a little further into it, uh, it's from Eric Briggs and they want to know, what are the results of York University's Mars weather experiment from the Phoenix lander? Right, so uh, the, 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 the weather station that we had there was measuring uh, a whole variety of atmospheric uh, quantities, you know, wind speeds, temperatures, vertical structure in the atmosphere. That was where we actually began to realize that the cloud structure on Mars was far more complicated and far more reminiscent of Earth's cloud structure. Up until that point in time, yeah, we'd looked at the sky and yes, we'd measured some various atmospheric phenomena, but we did not realize how reminiscent the atmosphere on Mars in terms of weather was to here on Earth. Yes, it's a different gas and it's a different temperature structure and so on, but the, the type of cloud formations were really very reminiscent of what we see here on Earth. And that all came out of the Phoenix mission. Uh, the winds ebb and flow during the course of the Martian day, just like winds ebb and flow because of heat patterns here on Earth. Uh, I showed you the uh, LIDAR instrumentation that showed uh, the, the snow falling uh, from the sky. Uh, so those types of structures in the Martian atmosphere until the Phoenix mission were really not well understood. Uh, the Mars Pathfinder, even uh, the uh, Spirit and Opportunity rovers, all the way back to the uh, Viking uh, missions, they didn't pay a whole lot of attention to the sky. They were far more interested in the geology on the ground. That all changed with Phoenix. And that's why both curiosity and perseverance carry with them quite sophisticated atmospheric atmospheric monitoring and why a, a significant fraction of each day is spent literally just imaging the sky uh, so that we can actually track and trace the uh, cloud movements. So I have, this one's my favorite question so far. It's from Bruce again, and it's, what color would the early Mars sky seem like? Uh, early morning uh, and 
late afternoon, if you're looking towards the horizon, believe it or not, the sky will actually look somewhat blue because of the scattering properties in your line of sight. But as the sun gets higher in the sky, you saw it in most of those images, the sky does tend to go back to this sort of salmon, sort of dusty cinnamon -y color. Uh, Raleigh scattering can't happen on Mars. The, the atmosphere is just too thin. We get blue skies here because of the preferential scattering of short wavelength radiation in our atmosphere. That's not happening on Mars. But because the atmosphere does have a fairly uh, large amount of suspended dust, then that acts in a scattering manner. And of course, your line of sight to the horizon is going to have the thickest or the, the, the largest concentration, largest column density of particulate matter. And that's why you get the blue scattering of light uh, towards the horizon. So sunrise, sunset, uh, you will be able to see a bit of a, a bluey horizon, but towards the top of the sky, it's the salmon color. And as the sun moves away from the horizon, yeah, you're back to your salmon pinks and so on. Great. Uh, we have Blake again, uh, wanting to know your thoughts on the recent successful demonstration, uh, oxygen extraction experiment. Can it be scaled up in a reasonable way? It can. MOXIE was always designed to be able to scale up to human needs. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with it, MOXIE is an experiment, another engineering test uh, project on the surface of Mars, which took in carbon dioxide, basically heated the bejeebies out of it and broke it into carbon monoxide and oxygen. Very trivial amounts, only a few grams per, per minute, uh, or per hour actually, uh, but nonetheless, the mechanism that would allow us to take the material that was present in the atmosphere and turn it into something that was more useful for us as humans has been clearly demonstrated by MOXIE. The plan is, when we get to the surface of Mars with people, is to take that uh, scale model and bring it up to an industrial size, like basically a one-ton instrument uh, or manufacturing device that you plonk onto the surface of Mars, use the solar energy uh, to power it, because of course the clouds that I've been talking about don't block very much solar energy. So you've got, you know, 20, uh, not 24 seven, but yeah, you know, 12 hours of sunshine, which gives you 12 hours of solar energy that would be used to heat the carbon, uh, carbon dioxide to extract oxygen and to be able to lift off from the surface of Mars Basically, the, the, the numbers are for four astronauts, you need about 25 tons of oxygen, liquid oxygen, uh, to be able to lift off the surface of Mars. You only need about one ton per astronaut, actually, to survive a year. Uh, so, you know, MOXIE would be on the surface of Mars, not only providing oxygen for humans to breathe, but the far more important aspect and where the quantity is much larger, where we need much larger quantities, is to be able to create rocket fuel liquid oxygen rocket fuel. And so MOXIE's big brother, the version of MOXIE that's on the surface of now, scaled up to being about one ton in, in mass, would be able to deliver over the course of a year, more than 25 tons of oxygen that we would be able to use. All right, uh, we're almost there. So we have from Leo to CAF, uh, what is the current accepted or favored theory for Mars changing, Mars is changing axial tilt? Um, at the moment, to the best of my knowledge, and I must admit, I haven't been following this debate, but the main reason that Mars's axis, uh, what, what we call its obliquity, the direction in space that its axis is pointing, it keeps moving around. It moves all the way from perpendicular to its orbital plane over to about 40 degrees, uh, whereas Earth stays 23 and a half degrees plus or minus one degree. The stability of Earth's axial tilt is attributed to the moon. The moon's gravitational presence basically stabilizes the motion of the axis of rotation. It doesn't preclude us rotating on our axis. It doesn't preclude the axis of rotation processing across the sky. In the case of the Earth, that takes about 26,000 years. But it does, the Moon does help maintain the obliquity angle being quite stable. Mars does not have a large satellite. Phobos and Deimos are puny by comparison. They, they have no influence 
on Mars's uh, axis of rotation. And so the fact that it flips from zero to 40, and that's a theory, by the way, I mean, we've not been able to uh, uh, perform measurements on the surface yet that have verified that. Uh, but it should be written in the rock layers in terms of seasonal variation. So we should be able to, one of these days, figure it out exactly. But our expectation is that the axis of rotation will vary from zero to 40. And the main reason for that is a lack of large stabilizing satellite. The, the moon basically exerts a torque on our planet, which is a force acting across a radius arm. And that torque is nice and stable for the Earth it doesn't exist for Mars. So Mars sort of flops around. And by the way, the, the mission that is on the surface at the moment, InSight, uh, that was the mission that arrived in 2018, is actually measuring not only the obliquity, but also the precession rate of the Mars, uh, uh, the Mars axis of rotation. It has to observe at least one full cycle of Mars around the sun, which it has done. It's on its second cycle, and it's measuring the very, very exact pointing of Mars's rotation axis to give us more insight into just this question. What are the physical characteristics of the axis of rotation, and how is it varying with time? Excellent. Uh, so we have one from Brian. Uh, they'd like to know what would be the most likely duration of a round trip to Mars for humans. So we're talking trip there and back plus wait time on Mars. The going number is about two and a half years, so about 30 months. So basically, uh, you, you go to Mars, nine months travel time, we're, when our technology is still fairly feeble in that regard. Uh, and you only get to be able to go between Earth and Mars with our technology once every 26 months. So you have to then hang out for about a year, a little less than a year, and then the planets get back into the right or get, you know, get, get back to the right configuration. Uh, and then you take nine months to come back. So nine and nine and 12. So I guess that's 30 months, 32 months. So about two and a half years or so is the going number as far as Mars, Earth, sorry, Earth, Mars, and back again. Great. And I think finally, we have Bruce Kasugi again. They'd like to know Earth's atmosphere protects us from many meteors. Uh, would meteor strikes be a considerable hazard to humans on Mars? Uh, not a considerable hazard, but certainly a higher hazard than we have here. Uh, you know, Earth picks up I don't know, something like 80,000 kilograms of space rock every single day. Uh, it, it's quite amazing how much stuff rains through our atmosphere. A significant amount of it burns up because of uh, the atmospheric uh, heating that takes place, but we still get thousands of rocks that land on, on the surface, uh, but they tend to be relatively small. Uh, so yes, the, the uh, possibility of being struck by a meteorite on the surface of Mars is certainly higher but you know, when all is said and done, think about the land area on Mars. The land area on Mars is comparable to the continental land mass of this planet. 70% you know, of our surface area is water, 30% is continents. The 30% continents, land surface-wise, here on Earth is about the total amount of uh, surface area on Mars. We do certainly see meteors uh, screaming across our sky, but the number that actually land in our area and the actual number that could land in our area in the absence of an atmosphere is still very, very few. So the, the sort of numbers that I have seen uh, don't suggest that it is a significant hazard, but it is certainly higher than it is here. Um, you know, the, the small stuff, that comes through the atmosphere, you know, there is still 1% of atmosphere. So there is still some measure of protection. The really small stuff is still going to burn up. Uh, Mars's cross section, of course, is a little smaller than the Earth. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have as large uh, 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 an impact, if you will, on the material that's flying around the solar system. Um, I've not seen any indication from anything that I have read that suggests that it's a likely possibility that uh, any of our space habitats on the surface of Mars would be hit. But it is higher than it is here on Earth. But it's incredibly low here on Earth. 
All right, thank you so much for answering all those questions. I think uh, that's all we have in the chat for this round. Okay. Thanks, Shaheen, for relaying all these questions. And thank you so much, Paul, for taking time to answer them. We have all learned so much tonight. 